As the new millennium dawned, first-person shooters on console continued to lag a long way behind their PC counterparts. Games like GoldenEye and Perfect Dark on the Nintendo 64 proved there was plenty of potential, and the PlayStation had one or two notable releases itself, such as Medal of Honor and Quake 2, but the gap between platforms remained significant throughout the 90s. Half-Life, Quake 3, and a wealth of other PC titles were leaps and bounds beyond anything console gamers could get their hands on. Then Halo Combat Evolved released, and it changed everything. Halo Combat Evolve launched in late 2001, and it could not have arrived at more perfect a moment. Sony's PlayStation 2, Nintendo's GameCube, and indeed Microsoft's Xbox were all fresh as daisies having launched that same year, and gamers across the world were excited to see what Marvel Studios could create with an entire generation of 3D development experience under their belts, and bucket loads of extra graphical horsepower to take advantage of. A big plus for Combat Evolved was that it was available on Xbox from day one, as Microsoft's marquee title among the 19-strong roster of games you could choose from at launch in the US. If you purchased the console, it was extremely likely you also grabbed yourself a copy of Halo's Maiden Outing, the story of the super soldier clad in green armour exploring the ringworld known as Installation 04 while battling humanity's sworn enemy the Covenant, and later alien zombie nightmare the Flood, captured the imagination of most who played it, and Master Chief quickly became the face of the Xbox brand. It helped that reviews were generally glowing too, with some stating that Combat Evolved set a new standard for what could be expected from a console shooter, but even so, it's only with hindsight that it becomes truly apparent just how influential Halo ended up being. Over the years, there have been many successful FPSs which have been copied by other developers, who take their best bits and repackage them. However, this often happens only as part of temporary fads which fade as soon as the next big thing comes along. The effect Halo had on the FPS genre, on the other hand, can still be seen everywhere to this day. I can think of very few games quite as revolutionary as Halo Combat Evolved, and the list of reasons as to why Bungie's Pièce de Résistance was so transformative is ludicrously long. Before I get too involved chatting about everything on that list, it should also be acknowledged that Bungie had a history of breaking the mould years prior to them becoming bona fide sci-fi superstars. Bungie's Mac-exclusive FPS Marathon, released in 1994, was the first shooter which allowed its audience to look wherever they liked, whenever they wanted, using a mouse. If you're aged enough to remember the olden days, like I unfortunately am, movement and aiming in the majority of shooters were both controlled using the keyboard, and you could generally only turn left and right or strafe to track your enemies, disregarding one or two games like System Shock, for example, which did allow you to look up and down. Marathon giving you the ability to aim anywhere with the flick of your wrist then, was a monumental leap forward. In fact, a very strong case could be made that the introduction of free look is the most important innovation the genre has, or will ever, see. Now, let's return to Halo and its outrageous amount of ingenuity. I want to begin by talking about what I call the moment-to-moment -moment considerations, that is, the micro-innovations that come into play constantly, such as the game's controls, two-weapon system, rechargeable shield, and the like. Do not worry though, I will also discuss the big picture concepts, including Combat Evolved Sandbox, Environment, AI, and the like, a little bit later too. Out of all the things that made Combat Evolve such an enormous step up from other shooters on the market, for me, it's the way it controls which was perhaps most vital to its success. Its AI, its scale, its graphics, all of Bungie's work in those areas, and plenty more, would have been for naught if Halo was a nightmare to handle. There was much doubt about the suitability of using a controller for first-person forays back in the day. If you'd have asked PC gamers to share their views on the matter prior to Halo, quite a few would have laughed and said there was no way a console could come close to replicating the ease of movement and aiming afforded by a keyboard and mouse. Becoming accustomed to using the Xbox controller's left stick to move and right stick to aim then would have been a sizeable hurdle for many to get over. 
While some will try to claim Bungie invented dual analog movement and aiming, that is certainly not the case. Games such as Alien Resurrection on the PlayStation featured it, and further back, you could use two controllers to achieve the same effect in 1997's GoldenEye. The original Time Splitters, a PlayStation 2 launch title which arrived a month before Halo, also included the option. When it comes to twin stick controls and many of the other innovations I'll touch on during this section, Bungie didn't necessarily invent the concepts entirely but rather popularise them by taking existing ideas and adapting them to be most effective, and that is a very important distinction to make. That is to take nothing away from Bungie though, there was no evidence any of them would prove popular with the mainstream gamer, and so each and every one of them still carried plenty of risk. I know the ordnance techs usually take care of your targeting sensors, but we're short of time, Chief. Just look at each of the flashing panels to target them. When you lock on, it'll change colour. Okay, that looks good. There are two additions to Halo's controls which are a great example of Bungie's adaptation in action, both of which fall under the banner of Aim Assist, Auto Aim and Magnetism. You'll know Auto Aim is engaged when you target an enemy and your crosshair turns red, something which occurs at different distances depending on the weapon you're wielding. When that happens, the game will subtly tweak the trajectory of your bullets so they're more likely to make contact with the baddie in question, although it should be noted it will sometimes engage to a lesser extent when your reticle isn't red. It's worth bearing in mind too that this is commonly referred to as bullet magnetism in the present, but to avoid confusion, or possibly add more, who knows, I'm using the terms coined by Bungie in the game's files. Magnetism essentially acts like, well, a magnet, slowing your turning speed when your crosshair moves over an enemy so it's easier for you to stay locked onto them. It also somewhat accounts for your foe's smaller movements as well, helping make micro-aiming adjustments which were traditionally much easier to pull off using a mouse also viable with a controller. Again, your choice of weapon and the range you're using it from factor into when it will be used and how strong it will be. This pair of finely tuned features combined to make Halo's aiming more intuitive than it had any right to be, and that was absolutely crucial when you consider the huge number of gamers who would have been getting used to twin stick combat for the first time ever. Another duo of game-changing inclusions to Halo's controls were the dedicated melee and grenade buttons. Just as impactful as aim assist, but less subtle. Together, they ensure it's as easy as it could possibly be to utilise Master Chief's kit to its fullest. Most PC titles of the time would force you to equip each like you would a weapon, which made using them a far less tempting proposition than it should have been, as doing so was clunky and forced you to, albeit temporarily, switch away from your equipped firearm. By the time you'd managed to get your grenade or melee weapon in your hands, the opportunity to use either to their best effect may well have passed. I myself remember barely using them while playing shooters which predated Halo for exactly those reasons, before quickly learning they were an invaluable part of encounters when getting to grips with Combat Evolved. The upgrade to accessibility meant it didn't take long at all for me to start instinctively using Master Chief's powerful melee to finish off an elite once his shield was down, or begin lobbing grenades all over the shop to clear out crowds of enemies. From here, we'll transition away from the purely control-based innovations and examine further other ways Halo fundamentally changed moment-to-moment -moment FPS gameplay. A big surprise was that Master Chief could only carry two weapons at once, which you could switch between at the push of a button. At first glance, it was a mechanic which seemed a tad regressive. Nearly every other FPS would load you up with enough guns and ammunition to start a small coup, and you had access to all of them all of the time. On PC, they'd normally be mapped to your keyboard's numbers, and on console, you'd use one or two buttons to rotate backwards and forwards through them, which could prove quite the challenge during a heated engagement. Even so, it meant you always had precisely the weapon you needed to excel, no matter the situation you found yourself in. The two-weapon limitation in Halo added an additional layer of decision-making to proceedings, and Bungie designed gameplay around it to perfection. There are a good variety of weapons, and every single one of them has strengths and weaknesses which regularly come into play. The Plasma Pistol, for example, is great for getting rid of elite shields quickly, but won't do much damage to them after, while the Shotgun is the most effective tool for clearing out hordes of bloodthirsty flood. Likewise, you may ignore the rocket launcher due to its relatively low ammo capacity, 
capacity unless you have an inkling you could soon be tackling Covenant vehicles, at which point it becomes a far more enticing prospect. Equally, you have to consider your environment as well as your enemies. An assault rifle might give you an edge during close quarters combat, but if you then find yourself outside in a more spacious area, it becomes little more than a pea shooter. I could describe each and every weapon in a similar manner too. Of course, there is one gun which none of that applies to, the pistol. The pistol is in a league of its own, shredding enemies from long range, short range and everything in between, no matter whether you're facing off against Covenant or Flood. It even kills Hunters, the Covenant's biggest and baddest, with a single bullet if you're able to get behind them. Ammo economy is also incredibly well balanced to support the mechanic. Usually you'll have enough bullets, needles or plasma rounds to keep you going for a while, but with ammo for human weapons thin on the ground and two out of three Covenant guns unable to be reloaded at all, you're continually encouraged to rotate your arsenal. Because of how beautifully Bungie implemented the system, what could have been frustrating became something far more nuanced. Unlike other games, not only did you have to think about which weapons would work best based on the environments and enemies you'd already come across or anticipated coming across, you also had to think quickly during skirmishes thanks to the limited ammo on offer, switching up your loadout on the fly depending on what was available on the battlefield. It meant combat required an extra portion of brain on top of the usual amount of brawn. Weapons weren't the only thing you had to manage two of while fending off wave after wave of aliens either, you also had to keep an eye on your shield and health too. Your shield is a rechargeable meter which depletes as you take damage until it eventually breaks, with audio cues letting you know when it's down as well as when it's charged back up. A sensible inclusion which prevents you from having to constantly look at the top left of the screen while busy. If you remain in harm's way with no shield left, your health will then begin to drain until you find cover and allow your shield to recharge. Your health bar functions much like it did in other FPSs at the time, dropping lower and lower until you find a medkit which fully restores it or it empties completely and you die. Like the two weapon system, it's another way of encouraging you to make quick and considered choices during gameplay. Assuming your shield is up, you can dive into the fray and begin blasting until you hear its warning sound. When that happens, you have a decision to make. If you think the battle can be concluded sooner rather than later, you can push on and give up some of your health. Or if too many enemies remain for immediate victory to be guaranteed, you can fall back and lick your wounds before advancing forward again. What's so wonderful about it is that it aids newcomers and veterans in equal measure. For new players, it grants some leniency and gives them room to make mistakes without being punished should they decide to fall back at the right moment. For those more experienced playing on harder difficulties, it means there is always a chance of making it through even the hardest parts of the campaign with just a sliver of health if you're a master of managing your shield. It's testament to how extraordinary Halo Combat Evolve's fundamentals were that everything I've spoken about so far can still be found in the bulk of first-person shooters today. Whether it's the dual analog controls with aim assist, the dedicated melee and grenade buttons, the two-weapon system, or recharging shield mechanic, more commonly recharging health nowadays, all of them are still core parts of FPS design. Nothing better highlights how influential Halo has been than the fact that many of its features are still being used by other developers as the foundations for their games, near unchanged, more than two decades after it first hit store shelves. As much as Bungie redefined what was possible from an FPS thanks to the controls and mechanics underpinning its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, I personally don't think Halo would have been half as impactful without the big picture innovations which accompanied them. If its gameplay had been attached to the same old brown and grey, narrow corridor shooter stylings of the Dooms, Quakes and similar so prevalent at the time, then Combat Evolved would have been considered simply an extremely solid take on a familiar formula. It's during this portion of the video things are going to get temporary temporarily spicy. A prevailing narrative which has been around since 2001 and will probably still be around well into the future is that Halo was only amazing for a console FPS and that PC gamers had already seen everything it had to offer. That is a load of rubbish, a cacophony of absolute nonsense, it is staggeringly incorrect, and anyone who holds that opinion should never be trusted when it comes to their views regarding video games. For context, I discovered the joys of the PC shooter during the mid to late 90s and developed a variety 
voracious appetite for them, playing anything and everything I possibly could. Whether it was a slow-paced single-player affair like Rainbow Six, or a reflex-reliant multiplayer blast em up like Unreal Tournament didn't matter to me, I just couldn't get enough. To put it bluntly, by the time Halo arrived, I already had a huge amount of PC FPS experience, and so definitely was not someone new to the genre blinded by Halo's console majesty. The view I've held since 2001 isn't any different in the present, and it is this. Yes, there were plenty of titles in the genre on PC which were trendsetters, think Half-Life with its scripting, set pieces and various other innovations for example. PC also had features console gamers weren't able to take advantage of, like robust online multiplayer, sorry Dreamcast your offering wasn't quite up to snuff, and there was also far more choice of much higher quality than on consoles. Nothing, however, and I do mean nothing on PC, offered what Halo Combat Evolved did. There are several ingredients which combine to create Halo's special source, a mix of features which made the wider experience completely and utterly enthralling and set it apart from anything seen on PC. They are its atmosphere aesthetic and scale, its sandbox, its enemies and their AI, and the option to play the entire campaign from start to finish split screen with a mate. I'll talk through each in turn. Upon release, Combat Evolved was something of a graphical powerhouse which made great use of the Xbox's beefy new innards. That in turn allowed Bungie to craft some of the most awe-inspiring environments that had ever been seen in a video game. Everyone remembers their first time stepping out onto Installation 04 at the beginning of the game's second mission and coming to the realisation that the enormous world in front of them was theirs to explore. There was also an air of mystique about the strange ring world you found yourself on that I don't think any other game in the series has ever been able to reproduce to anywhere near the same extent. Investigating the sweeping green hills of Halo, the mountainous terrain of Truth and Reconciliation, the snowy expanses of Assault on the Control Room, or the almost tropical climbs of the Silent Cartographer's Island brought with it unparalleled variety and a real sense of wonder. But throughout it all, to me at least, it always felt like something wasn't quite quite right. The strange grey structures littering those beautiful natural environments were a stark reminder that the ring once had other inhabitants, likely alien, with their own goals and ambitions, and the cool colour tone which somewhat muted even the brightest areas made everything feel a touch artificial, which of course it was. This cave is not a natural formation. Someone built it, so it must lead to the further the campaign progressed, the harder it was to ignore that nagging uneasiness in the back of your mind. The swamps of 343 Guilty Spark were deeply unsettling, as was the reveal which followed shortly after, and the library which followed was a monolithic, madness-inducing maze. As things began to go to hell on the ring, much of the colour which made earlier missions so visually appealing was stripped away. Day was often replaced by night, greys and other neutral colours began to dominate even more, and in general during its second half, in large part because of this shifting aesthetic, the campaign started to feel much darker and moodier than it did during its early days. While later entries in the series would try to one-up Combat Evolve's atmosphere, aesthetic and scale, in my mind none of them quite managed to do so. They are all still fantastic in their own ways, but there was something so unique about the way the three blended together during Halo. Laying eyes on an alien world, seeing the ring jut out into the sky and exploring different biomes, all the while feeling perhaps a tad nervous but being unsure why, there really was nothing like it. Having atmosphere, aesthetic and scale unlike any other title on PC or otherwise is all well and good, but that world also needed to be filled with fun for it to truly flourish. A term you've no doubt heard bandied about is sandbox, which essentially refers to the weapons, vehicles, grenades and the like you can interact with while playing. It cannot be denied that Combat Evolved has the series' least complex sandbox even when taking only the original trilogy into account. Among other additions to introduce dual wielding and three featured equipment for the first time for example, but there's also a degree of beauty in that simplicity, where 2 and 3 of course took inspiration from the series' first effort, adding depth where necessary necessary, Halo itself feels to me like a game which bridges the gap between 90s corridor shooters and the new modern era for the FPS genre it was helping usher in. It kept some of the simplicity of old, but also required more strategy thanks to its slower pace, a winning combination in my book. 
As touched on earlier with regards to weapons, the appeal of Halo's arsenal stems from the idea of strengths and weaknesses, with each doing certain jobs better than others. Because the roster is limited, there is little overlap between weapons, so you never end up lugging around two guns which essentially provide the same utility. Every one of them is viable in most situations, and if a specific weapon is truly necessary, Bungie will usually leave one lying around nearby just in case. Again, this is all true other than for the pistol, which sort of breaks the game due to how effective it is in basically every situation. Vehicle-wise, it's the same story, with each of the four on offer shining in different circumstances. Ghosts are the fastest of them all, allowing you to easily avoid taking damage while you zip across the battlefield in record time. They don't, however, do the most damage in the world. Then there's the Warthog. With only yourself behind the wheel and no marines along for the ride, it's slower than the Ghost and lacks its offensive capabilities, but with a pair of buddies accompanying you, it becomes a much deadlier proposition. The Scorpion sits at the opposite end of the spectrum from the Ghost. It may be a slow, lumbering beast, but what it lacks in speed, it more than makes up for in terms of firepower. If your number one priority is causing havoc and leaving a trail of destruction in your wake, there is no better choice. Finally, the Banshee is the only airborne vehicle, which is in itself a strength. That being said, while its primary use is reaching areas otherwise inaccessible, with the right pilot it can still cause a heck of a lot of damage at ground level as well. It's not really part of the sandbox per se, but the physics system Bungie implemented also adds a ton of weight to your actions, both in terms of weapons and vehicles. Grenades and explosions will send both enemies and vehicles flying through the air, with chain reactions between grenades commonplace. Using Halo's physics to grenade jump to new places or launch your friends out of bounds was great fun too, and it added an element of experimentation to the game which a lot of people, myself included, really valued. There's one example in particular which always brings to mind when I think about the genius of Halo's sandbox, and that is the first open area in Assault on the Control Room. It includes practically everything that makes it so magnificent. You head out into a vast open space where you're likely to spot a group of marines under heavy fire from Covenant ground troops and ghosts. In the distance, a Wraith, the only non-pilotable vehicle in the game, rains down molten plasma blobs in your direction, and there are also several turrets set up around the edge of the area too. You can kill the Grunt, manning a turret right by the entrance and cover your allies from afar, but a static position is dangerous given the Wraith, so it's more likely you'll make your way over to the Marines. There you can grab bullets for your conventional weapons, but Bungie also leaves a rocket launcher, ideal for taking out vehicles and turrets, and a sniper rifle, great for thinning out the Covenant reinforcements which soon begin converging on your location. You're under no obligation to fight on foot either. Instead, you might decide to hop in the Warthog also lying nearby. After all, that will allow you and some of the Marines some extra mobility. Or, if you don't give a monkeys about the Marines, you could try commandeering one of the Ghosts parked nearby instead for an extra bit of speed. If all that sounds like a whole load of work, you could also just ignore the battle entirely and head in the direction of the next area straight away. Once you arrive in that area, there is then more of pretty much everything but in a considerably smaller space to keep events fresh, with a Scorpion also thrown in for good measure. Every step of the way, Bungie has clearly thought about different playstyles and accounted for them, giving you everything you need to play the section precisely how you'd like. Halo's sandbox is built around choice, and nowhere in the campaign is that more evident than during that I've just described. Honestly, the game could have done with additional sections like it. Given its quality, it's a crying shame that five of the campaign's ten levels, that's right, half of it in total, do not feature any vehicles whatsoever. When Halo does use its sandbox to its fullest though, it is a remarkable experience, and it makes for what I still believe to be one of the series' most entertaining combat loops. The enemies you fight within Halo's sandbox are also exceptional, especially the Covenant. They still hold up very well as adversaries in the present, which is only in part because of how much personality Bungie managed to inject into the different alien races. The thing that food nipples waiting for me at the starship does me a coup if I were just a big, grunty thirst!
Like the weapons and vehicles I spoke about mere moments ago, the Covenant's various foot soldiers all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Grunts are your basic cannon fodder and are susceptible to nearly everything, but in large enough numbers or when using grenades, they can still be a legitimate threat. Jackals are tougher to take down and actually require strategy, as their shields are good at blocking head-on attacks and their charged plasma pistol shots can shatter your own shield in an instant. Good positioning becomes paramount when dealing with them and you'll quickly learn to make better use of your environment and any cover around you. Elites are the most challenging of the Covenant's ranks, with their energy shields making them Master Chief's most formidable opponent. They are strong, accurate and extremely deadly. Hunters always work in pairs and are strong at both long and short range, but unfortunately they're generally underwhelming. Their sheer presence should strike fear into even the most hardened Spartan, however as discussed previously, the pistol and its ability to kill them in a single shot makes them a laughing stock. The way all of them respond differently to your actions is also amazing. Different compositions of enemies will be more or less aggressive, sometimes opting to stay back, sometimes choosing to attempt to flank you. When under fire, jackals will try to dive out the way, and they have no qualms about moving to a more advantageous position. Kill an elite, and any grunts nearby are highly likely to flee. The elites themselves will do their best to dodge your shots, and if they take too much damage, will even run for cover so their own shield can recharge. The that shield entirely and they might lose their temper and decide to rush you. Stick a grenade to a grunt and they'll panic running in the direction of their squad mates. Stick a grenade to an elite and like when their shield is down they might just charge straight at you. There are tons more I've not mentioned too. This combination of the Covenant's different strengths and weaknesses and their dynamic nature on the battlefield lends encounters an incredible sensation of cause and effect. First, you have to formulate a plan depending on the makeup of the group you're facing, and then, once it's time to execute, you have to remain on your toes so you can appropriately deal with enemies' reactions to your onslaught. By comparison, the Flood really only charge directly at you, no matter what type of parasitic horror you're faced with. Infection forms, they'll head straight for you. Combat forms, they'll head straight for you. Carrier forms, they'll… you get the idea. That is a relatively reductive description of them though, and while we won't dwell on the Flood for now, I will return to them shortly when I examine the two halves of Halo. It would also be remiss of me not to talk about Master Chief's Marine buddies who often join you on your adventure. There's plenty of them, which is good. They will hop in warthogs or sit on the side of your tank to provide additional firepower, which is great. But they are also not the sharpest knives in the box, or even the second or third sharpest honestly, which is a shame. Unless they have a sniper rifle, which turns them into a sort of sci-fi John Wick. They'll stick with you and actually do a decent job of helping you cut through the hordes of aliens, but they lack a self-preservation instinct and will get killed for the stupidest, most avoidable reasons. Like the Covenant, grunts in particular, they also have sparkling personalities, and their battlefield chatter makes them feel so much more human than they would do otherwise. Well, you're a sight for sore eyes, Chief. We're in a bad way. We've got wounded here. I'll call in a dropship to pick them up. On the topic of allies, the final ingredient in Halo's special sauce is the campaign's cooperative aspect. In 2001, the fact you could play something so special alone I found really rather mind-blowing, so being able to work your way through the whole shebang with a friend, on one console, in the same room, was something I could scarcely believe possible. I don't have as much to say about it as I have other aspects of the campaign. Split-screen co-op does what it says on the tin, but I can understand why to newer gamers who are only able to view Halo through the lens of the present, it's not overly exciting. After all, nowadays you can simply log in, connect with your friend, over the internet and get cracking right away. It's just not the same as having your pal in the same room with you though. Later entries, most notably Halo 5 Guardians and Halo Infinite, have not featured it at all, which I think is a disgrace given how many series veterans like myself believe it to be a core part of what makes Halo, Halo. Having a friend fighting alongside you may well be a godsend too, especially if you choose to play on one of Halo's harder difficulties. On easy and normal, any semi-adept Spartan should be able to successfully navigate most of the game's challenges, and although Heroic is a step up, it is, in my view, the way the game is meant to be played. Legendary is a much tougher challenge, particularly alone, but compared to later titles, I'm looking at you, Halo 2, it feels like a fair one. 
Because the sandbox is so consistently well balanced, every encounter is beatable as long as you utilise everything the game has to offer at the right moment. Apart from the flood-wielding rocket launchers who can and will explode you from any distance with extreme prejudice, they are an abhorrent enemy no matter what difficulty you're playing on, but on Heroic and Legendary in particular, they are unfair little monsters I think should have been greatly toned down or completely removed. With co-op gameplay covered, we've ticked everything off my list titled All the Things That Made Halo Revolutionary. I know I've been rabbiting on for a while now, but again, hopefully what's been discussed gives you as clear an indication as possible as to just how much of a game changer Combat Evolved was. We're now going to move on to look closer at the game's more creative side, studying its structure, story, characters and soundtrack. The Anniversary Edition might also come up at some point too, so apologies in advance for that. Let's begin by looking at the campaign structure. If you've watched any of my other longer pieces which often talk about the structure of certain video games, you'll know I love separating them into three parts like a book or story, the beginning, middle and end. I can't do that with Halo, however. It is not a title split into two thirds, but rather a game of two halves, with the dividing line between the pair being the shocking reveal of the Flood midway through sixth level 343 Guilty Spark. Combat Evolve's first half is one of the greatest runs of levels you'll ever encounter in a video game, and that is a hill I am more than willing to die on. The Pillar of Autumn might trick first-timers into thinking they're playing another corridor shooter, but in actuality it's a cleverly designed mission which sets up Halo's story and tutorialises gameplay, introducing the basics in an environment less daunting than those which follow. Halo begins drip-feeding you even more complexity in a gigantic environment, with dropships, jackals, warthogs and a few new weapons all being introduced, and that scale is put to good use towards its end as you're given the freedom to rescue three groups of marines in one whatever order you fancy. Truth and Reconciliation's opening sniping sequence set against craggy cliffs and desolate spaces is tremendous, and while its second half on board a Covenant ship isn't as good, it's nevertheless still something not seen in the campaign prior. The Silent Cartographer is one of the best FPS levels of all time, starting with a classic D-Day-esque beach landing before you're let loose to explore a whole island however you please. Assault on the Control Room's vehicle sequences are spectacular in scale and some of the strong longest parts of the campaign, and finally 343 Guilty Spark turns the tone of the story on its head, using environmental storytelling of stunning quality to transition the campaign's atmosphere from open and wondrous to narrow and frightening. What is that? Where's that coming from, Everywhere. Mendoza? I don't... There! Mira! <laughs> ah! ah! Hold still! Out. Hold Get still! Let him have it! I tried to mention only the headlines from each mission during that recap, as if I were to recall every moment or detail I enjoy, I'd be sat here writing for the next two days. If that is something you're interested in, hit the card on screen now to check out my level by level detailed analysis of the entire campaign. Beyond the absurd amount of situational and environmental variety, what makes Halo's first half so astounding is the way it's paced. The Pillar of Autumn is narrow, Halo opens things up, Truth and Reconciliation scales events back down, and then the Silent Cartographer is the most open up to that point. Assault on the Control Room then delivers even greater scale, after which 343 Guilty Spark narrows down to the point you might feel a little claustrophobic. You can see similar within each mission too, with Bungie constantly moving you back and forward between open spaces and enclosed hallways to keep proceedings fresh while creating a constant rhythm to progression. The combat, the set pieces, the story, all of them are amazing, but if they were just squashed together with zero regard for pacing, I don't think any of them would be as highly regarded as they've ended up being. Halo's second half, however, is a problem, and it's difficult to deny that the Flood are the primary cause of a lot of its issues. Not all of them, but a significant amount. I must confess, I am one of those people who loves the Flood too, although most of that is for narrative reasons. In gameplay terms, they're a mixed bag. After their big reveal, most will at first likely enjoy the change in strategy they necessitate. The Covenant use tactics, they react, and so you always have to be thinking about what they're going to do next as much as you have to think about what you're going to do next. The Flood has a tactic, one discussed earlier, which is charge straight at Master Chief until he is dead. 
Earlier, I spoke of how the simplicity of Halo's sandbox bridges the gap between 90s shooters and the modern era, and the Flood in their own way functions similarly. Fighting them is a throwback to times past as you battle through hordes of monsters with primitive AI in what are often nondescript hallways. It's loud and intense and in your face, but at the same time combat with them lacks the refinements which in 2001 made fighting the Covenant feel so fresh, and so eventually they do become repetitive. What exacerbates this problem is the environmental repetition during Combat Evolved's second half. It's something that is also present during the first. The endless purple corridors of truth and reconciliation aren't great, and assaults on the control rooms repeating circular rooms and bridges are incredibly tedious, but it's less noticeable thanks to those rough edges being attached to a sparkling diamond. While there are still some bright patches during the campaign's latter stages, the issues around copy and pasted environments are hard to ignore. The library may not be like anything else featured in the game, and is atmospheric and foreboding for a while, but by the time you arrive at its fourth floor after fighting seemingly endless waves of flood, you'll be more than ready for it to conclude. Two Betrayals is Assault on the Control Room backwards, with some banshees thrown in for good measure, and comes with many of the same irritations, although the multi-faction firefights with Flood and Covenant out on the snow are admittedly brilliant. Keys is a near carbon copy of Truth and Reconciliation, with an opening section in a rocky area followed by a trip through a Covenant ship in chaos thanks to the Flood. The Moor is sort of a repeat of the campaign's very first level as you return to the Pillar of Autumn, a derelict husk of its former self, again teeming with Flood. Original it is not, but the Warthog run at its end at least helps Halo end on a very high note indeed. Cortana to Echo 419. Two Covenant Banshees are approaching on your six. One school of thought regarding this second half is that it's actually rather impactful, as revisiting former locations with a Flood presence helps to clearly drive home the effect their release has had on Installation 04. I agree to an extent. Witnessing the relentless horror of the Flood is a terrible sight to behold, but I'm not convinced we needed to retread so much of the campaign's earlier stages for Bungie to make that point. If someone asked me to choose between seeing new environments being decimated by the Flood, or lots of environments I've already visited being decimated by the Flood, I would definitely choose the former, and I think, hand on heart, most others would too. Again, I see where people are coming from, but to me, it's something of an excuse for what are without doubt the weaker parts of the game. Thank goodness, then, that whether you're playing through Halo's unrivaled first half or are gritting your teeth as you slog through its second, Bungie's storytelling is consistently first-rate. Before diving deeper into the game's story, it makes sense to first touch on the characters involved. I don't think it's unreasonable to claim that the vast majority of them are archetypes seen fairly frequently on TV and in film and video games. Master Chief is the strong and silent saviour of humanity, a stoic super soldier in the mould of Doomguy or Gordon Freeman, but with a voice and consequently more depth. You alright? Never been better. You can't imagine the wealth of information. The knowledge, so much, so fast. It's glorious. So? What sort of weapon is it? What are you talking about? Let's stay focused. Halo, how do we use it against the Covenant? This ring isn't a cudgel, you barbarian. It's something else. Something much more important. Cortana is the wisecracking sidekick, always on hand to inject a little life into scenes which would otherwise run the risk of being very to the point. Cortana. I've spent the last 12 hours cooped up in here watching you toady about helping that thing get set to slit our throats. Hold on now. He's a friend. Oh, I didn't realize. He's your pal, is he? Your chum? Do you have any idea what that bastard almost made you do? Captain Jacob Keyes is the noble and brave leader who never hesitates to put himself in harm's way. All right, then. I'm initiating cold protocol article two. We're abandoning the auto. That means you too, Cortana. While you do what? Go down with the ship? In a manner of speaking. The object we found, I'm gonna try and land the autumn on it. With all due respect, sir, this war has enough dead heroes. 
And finally, Sergeant Johnson is the stereotypical loud-mouthed army sergeant. Once again, it is our job to finish what the Fly Boys started. We are leaving this ship platoon and engaging the Covenant on solid ground. When we meet the enemy, we will rip their skulls from their spines and toss them away laughing. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. Now move it out! Double time! That being said, there is some originality in the form of 343 Guilty Spark, who is for my money by far and away the most intriguing of the bunch. Oh, how I will enjoy every moment of its categorization! To think that you would destroy this installation as well as this record! I am shocked. Almost too shocked for words. Describing these beloved characters in such simplistic terms will to some sound like harsh criticism, but it isn't meant to be. On the contrary, I think the way they're written makes total sense. You have to keep in mind that Bungie had no clue whether Halo would prove to be the ginormous success it ended up being, launching a franchise which continues to this day, or would flop, consequently dooming the series. That doesn't necessarily present a storytelling problem in and of itself, but when you're already working hard to introduce a completely new universe to your audience over the course of a single game, complicating matters further by writing characters who are too nuanced or take a while to explain is an unnecessary risk. It would absolutely be possible to do that in a role-playing game, during which there's traditionally plenty of time to develop a cast, or even in a longish action-adventure title. But when your campaign is a shooter with a runtime of 8-10 to 10 hours, it definitely isn't needed. Character-wise, Halo Combat Evolved had one job to do, introduce a cast likeable enough that the audience is always eager to learn what will happen to them next, and it definitely succeeded. Perhaps the best part of Halo 2 is the way it takes the characters established during Combat Evolved and others and fleshes them out, while Halo 3 gets all their epic emotional moments as the trilogy draws to a close. Neither, however, would have been possible without Halo doing a solid job of introducing a cast who may not be the most layered you'll ever encounter, nor the most developed, but are immediately likeable regardless. Halo's characters do exactly what's needed of them to allow its story to shine, and boy oh boy does its story shine. It's a very self-contained tale compared to later entries, focusing only on events unfolding on Installation 04, and Bungie's reason for doing so I'd imagine would have been not too dissimilar to that regarding the game's characters. With no guarantee of a sequel, Combat of Old Story needed to be wrapped up in a nice neat bow. That way, if it were to be the only Halo ever released, anyone who played it would still get some satisfaction from the experience from a story perspective. There are some questions left hanging, which we'll get to in a jiffy, but all in all, it's a well-structured, satisfying affair which functions perfectly well as a standalone story. I should elaborate further on what that story actually is, and I'll do so as quickly as possible so as to not bore many of you watching who already know all the ins and outs. Basically, humanity is in a war with an alliance of alien races named the Covenant, and after discovering a mysterious ringworld, Master Chief is charged with preventing a powerful AI named Cortana from falling into their hands. Chief and Code discover that the installation is a weapon which the Covenant plan to use, and in the midst of trying to stop them, parasitic organism the Flood is accidentally let loose. Caretaker AI 343 Guilty Spark tries to help Master Chief activate the ring to destroy the Flood's food source, all life in the galaxy, but given Given that includes humanity, Chief instead decides to destroy the ring and by extension the Flood without firing Halo. In the end, he manages to detonate the crashed Pillar of Autumn's fusion reactors which demolishes the ring, and Chief and Cortana manage to escape by the skin of their teeth. Did anyone else make it? Scanning. Just dust and echoes. We're all that's left. We did what we had to do, for Earth. An entire Covenant Armada obliterated, and the Flood. We had no choice. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. I've obviously left out quite a few important plot points, but for those of you watching who are less familiar with how events play out, hopefully that does the trick. 
So, why is Halo's story so splendid? Well, for starters, its presentation was really rather impressive for an FPS which came out in 2001. Half-Life had set a new standard for storytelling in the genre in 1998 with its scripting and set pieces, and in addition to Combat Evolved featuring plenty of them itself, it also included a wealth of cinematics to add extra flavour. There were plenty of games out there which did one or the other, but few that did both to a high standard, and that definitely made Halo stand out. For the third or fourth time in this video, what I'm about to say might make diehard PC gamers begin to foam at the mouth, but there wasn't really anything on computer which delivered quite the same quality of presentation across a story so grand in scope. It's not even worth comparing Halo to anything on consoles at the time, as honestly nothing came remotely close. Long story short, while Halo 2 and 3 upped the ante significantly, Halo was incredibly impressive when compared to the majority of its peers. That air of mystique which has come up a few times already is also important in story terms. Not that many questions remained regarding the events on Installation 04, but there were a massive number of hanging threads regarding the wider universe for fans to discuss while anxiously awaiting a sequel. First and foremost, who were the forerunners who created the Ringworld? Guilty Spark's dialogue often implies they may have been humans of some description. Technically, this installation pulse has a maximum effective radius of 25,000 light years. But once the others follow suit, this galaxy will be quite devoid of life, or at least any life with sufficient biomass to sustain the flood. But you already knew that. I mean, how couldn't you? But it's never stated outright. Little is shared about the Flood's origins too, or whether they have any motivations beyond consume everything. Even the Covenant's aims and ambitions remain shrouded in some secrecy, although it was clear there was a religious element to them. There are a good deal more as well. I would spend hours and hours on message boards back in the day reading the various fan theories which emerged following Halo's release, and I found it all fascinating. Later titles still had their own unanswered questions, sure, but none of them ever quite managed to capture the magic of the years between Combat Evolved and 2, when so much of the wider story remained so puzzling. While that was a shame, it is also completely understandable. It was inevitable a degree of mystery would vanish as the world of Halo continued to be expanded upon. While nothing beats Halo 2 when it comes to sheer breadth and quality of storytelling, Halo still features some of the most memorable moments in the series. Cortana's panic when she realises that Captain Keys and company are about to unearth the Flood. Wait. No, that can't be. Oh, those Covenant fools. They must have known. There must have been signs. Slow down. You're losing me. The Covenant found something. Buried in this ring. Something horrible. And now, they're afraid. Something buried? Where? The Captain. We've got to stop the Captain. Keys? What the weapons we... cache he's looking for. It's not really... We can't let him get inside. I don't understand. There's no time. Get out of here, find keys, stop him. Before it's too late! The reveal of Keyes' shocking fate following his kidnapping. No human life signs detected. The captain, he's one of them. We can't let the flood get off this ring. You know what he'd expect... What he'd want us to do. A big part of why those story beats and others throughout Combat Evolved work is because of Master Chief and Cortana, who play off each other brilliantly. Keys, Guilty Spark, and others all do commendable jobs too, but how well the story was going to land was really down to whether our favourite duo won over their audience. I had a thought about the reason why their relationship is so successful while recently watching the scenes you've just seen and many more. Despite not being the most emotive character during this first entry in the series, it's easy to empathise with Chief regardless as we are essentially in the same position as him for much of the game. We are just as confused as he is, and he never has any knowledge of events outside that we also witness. However, I think it's fair to say he also lacks some of the personality he develops later in the series. If we connect with Chief through a shared lack of knowledge, then we connect with Cortana through shared emotions. Despite being the machine, she is the one who is often confused, shocked, horrified, adding the personality needed to ensure dialogue, whether during cinematics or gameplay, never becomes too impersonal. The two complement each other absolutely perfectly. 
finally, I cannot end a section about Halo's story without bringing up the reveal of the Flood, as it is one of the most impactful twists I've ever experienced in a video game. I've already covered their introduction being a mixed bag in gameplay terms, but from a narrative perspective, it is dynamite. This video isn't the place for me to rant on and on about all the clever touches Bungie added to signal their arrival, hit the card on screen now for that, but suffice to say they did a terrific job of pivoting Combat Evolve's campaign from sci-fi military shooter only to something much more interesting and terrifying. I still get messages all the time from fans of the series who were traumatised by the Flood's arrival when they first reached the campaign's midpoint, and I think that is the best compliment Bungie could possibly ask for. All in all, Halo's story is executed near flawlessly. Sensibly, Bungie doesn't try to introduce characters who are too complicated or weave a story too complex, instead focusing on how both could be used most effectively alongside the awe-inspiring universe they had begun to build. Later titles would expand upon nearly every aspect of that universe, but like its gameplay, Combat Evolve's story has a certain charm I believe is only attainable through relative simplicity and Bungie's focus on crafting a tale which would quite easily work as a standalone story if needed to. I still find it just as fulfilling as any of its sequels, but in a different way. Combat Evolve's music is, for me, just as vital in evoking the right emotions as the story we've just talked about is. Discussion of soundtracks is something I usually leave till the very end of these retrospectives, but on this occasion I feel like that would be particularly cruel considering the immense calibre of the work done by composers Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore. So I've gone against the grain and stuck something else in last, which, as you'll understand soon enough, was for good reason. I am what you might describe as a super fan of the Halo series music, and Combat Evolve's OST is my personal favourite of them all. No word of a lie, I'd guess I've not gone more than a few days since its release without listening to at least one or two tracks from it. Nevertheless, I will endeavour to remain analytical and unbiased. Halo's theme is one of the most easily recognisable pieces of music in all of gaming, thanks to the distinctive Gregorian chant it begins with, a chant which was actually written specifically for the track. The fast-paced percussion and strings which follow are amazing too, and it's hard to believe it was composed over just three days. It only actually plays twice throughout the entire campaign, first during the silent cartographer's beach landing, believe that what they call the silent cartographer is somewhere under this island. The cartographer is a map room that will lead us to Halo's control center. The island has multiple structures and installations. One of them contains the map room. We're close to the LZ. It's gonna be hot. Get set to cut out quick. Touchdown, hit it, Marines! And again while the end credits roll. You would be forgiven, then, for perhaps wondering how it can be considered a theme when the track itself only plays twice, or three times I suppose if you count during the main menu before you actually begin the game. Well, it's because it appears in a million and one other places too. Its vocals are used during Covenant Dance, and its strings are incorporated into On a Pale Horse and Perilous Journey, to name but a few of the many examples. There's even a version featuring an electric guitar you're treated to every now and then, rock anthem for saving the world. It makes what is already a terrific piece of music resonate so much more and it's such an important part of Halo's soundtrack as a whole. The rest of the OST I think of as being divided into several types of music. There's the ambient tracks, the militarily themed tracks, and the otherworldly tracks. The ambient tracks I've less to say about, but they do their job well enough. Favourites of mine include What Once Was Lost, the desperately creepy backing track which plays as you explore the swamp at the beginning of 343 Guilty Spark. I also like Ambient Wonder, which is one of the more subtle examples of parts of Halo's theme being used. Then there's the militarily themed tracks. A constant, precise drum rhythm which evokes images of soldiers marching into battle is, to me, their defining characteristic. These tend to be used more often than not during cutscenes or gameplay involving other humans, like Brothers in Arms kicking in at the end of the Pillar of Autumn to help provide a pulse-pounding crescendo. Heads up everyone, this is it! We're entering the ring's atmosphere in 
five. Sure you wouldn't rather take a seat? We'll be fine. If I still had fingers, they'd be crossed. Finally, there's the otherworldly tracks, and it's these synth-based marvels which make up the bulk of the soundtrack. It's really difficult to choose one or two examples, as there are so many I adore and would love to spend a good few minutes wittering on about. I reckon many would point to Under Cover of Night as being one of the standouts, with its use as you cross a dark, snowy battlefield surrounded by Flood and Covenant being of particular note. Covenant Dance is another absolute banger, and how different it is from Under Cover of Night really serves to highlight the breadth of Marty and Michael's talent. Quite a bit earlier, I praised Halo's atmosphere, aesthetic, and scale for contributing hugely to the air of mystique and sometimes feelings of unease you might feel while exploring Installation 04, and the game's otherworldly music is a core part of that as well. Besides the content of the soundtrack itself, what I love is how considered the use of every track is. They aren't just included randomly for seemingly no reason, nor do any of them ever feel like they're being overused. At precisely the right moment, each of them is played, and then just as quick as they arrived, they fade out, to be used again only when best suits. Bungie shows a great deal of restraint, which is very impressive bearing in mind the outstanding selection of tracks they had to work with. Save the best till last, end on a high note, last but not least. These are phrases I usually live by, and I mostly always do my best to end my videos talking about something positive. Unfortunately, that won't be the case this time. I tried really hard to find a place to vent about Halo Combat Evolves Anniversary Edition earlier on in this video, as like it or not, it is a part of the game's history and should be acknowledged. But I couldn't, and so here we are. If you've reached this point in the video and are someone who has never played Halo before, but think you'd like to try it, I implore you, play with the original graphics and sounds. While the Anniversary Edition might look a lot prettier at first glance, dig a little deeper and you'll soon realise that it changes too much in too drastic a manner. The colour palette is much too warm, which destroys the unnatural coolness Installation 04 has in the original, and areas like 343 Guilty Spark Swamp or entire levels like Two Betrayals, which are meant to be dark and foreboding, are instead brighter, losing a good deal of their appeal in the process. It sort of works for the silent cartographer, which is meant to be a sun-drenched island, but the majority of the time it's to the game's detriment. There's also way too little attention paid to to important environmental details, like the blood-drenched hallways also in 343 Guilty Spark, while the bulk of the rest of the indoor areas throughout the game are over-designed and far too visually busy, especially with so many particle effects added during combat. The reworked soundtrack isn't that great either, but there is one small ray of light in the form of the terminals hidden across different levels, which can only be accessed when playing the Anniversary Edition. It's definitely worth hopping on YouTube and giving them a watch, as they add a whole lot to the story and are generally generally very well executed. Keys. Take out them. Captain. Service number 01928-19912. JK. You will not have me. We all. Again, I apologise for being such a negative Norman so late in the day, but I cannot overstate how much the Anniversary Edition's changes take away from the experience as a whole. If you think you might give Halo Combat Evolved a go, again, please, for the love of all that is good and holy, use the original graphics and sound. If I had to sum up the message I wanted to get across during this video in a single sentence, it would be this. Halo Combat Evolved is one of the greatest first-person shooters ever, and one of the most influential video games of all time. Every so often, a game arrives in a certain genre which defies expectations and raises the bar for what is to be expected moving forward, and Halo is absolutely one of those games. Gameplay-wise, it provided definitive proof shooters could work brilliantly on consoles using a controller, and it came with a raft of other innovations, such as the two-weapon system and recharging shield mechanic, which made it a non 
non-stop delight to play. What's more, Bungie managed to implement all of that at scale too, with Combat Evolve's sublime sandbox, enormous atmospheric environments and unrivaled AI coming together to turn firefights into a symphony of perfectly conducted chaos. You could also complete the entire campaign from beginning to end split-screen with a friend, a major selling point which has been criminally undervalued in recent years. And again, I also want to casually drop in that I believe its first half up to the end of 343 Guilty Spark to be one of the most brilliant runs of levels we'll ever witness. We must also not forget the more creative side of things. In addition to Halo's gameplay, the nuts and bolts, its story, while simplistic compared to later entries, featured fantastic characters, included plenty of twists and turns, and had an incredible air of mystery surrounding it. All of its most memorable scenes, and most of its gameplay too, were also complemented by a soundtrack that I still tune into near daily. It's no surprise given everything I've just summarised that Master Chief became the face of the Xbox brand and Halo its flagship title from pretty much day one. To conclude this video, I also want to share an opinion regarding Xbox which might prove controversial as well. Beyond simply being the game which made the launch of the Xbox brand a success, I genuinely believe that if it weren't for Halo Combat Evolved being the revolutionary, jaw-dropping, genre-defining game it was, Xbox would have suffered an untimely death quite some time ago. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls and Spartans. If you had a cracking time and would love to see more long-form content, then do consider liking and subscribing, letting me know your thoughts and supporting the channel via Patreon. And with any luck, our paths will cross again soon.